It's on? Is it going? Okay, volume levels are good. Okay, good morning, everyone. So it's great to be back here again. So thanks for, thanks for your dedication to studying the Word of God and to see how it's going to apply to our lives and for coming in for the second week of our Sunday School class on the Book of Job. So I'm going to ask if somebody else could open in prayer today. Any volunteers for opening in prayer before I volunteer somebody? Five, four. Oh, thank you. Go ahead, Heidi. Lord, we give you praise for this new day. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. We invite your presence into this uh, Sunday school this morning. We pray that hearts would be edified and that we would have a clearer understanding of who you are um, at the end of our class. Um, we just thank you so much for our church and um, its Bible focus. And we ask that your name would be glorified in all of the services. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yep, thanks for that. Um, now, you asked in your prayer if we would understand more about God or see a greater vision of who he is. Once we get to these middle sections in the book of Job, that, that cloudiness comes into play a lot more. So we'll see how God's gonna, going to answer that prayer. Uh, just for some background, if you're not attending every Sunday or you want a Sunday off and you don't want to drive all the way into here or you're traveling or you know people that aren't coming to uh, coming to Sunday school, maybe because of some social distancing or some other things that they're practicing. There is a class website. Uh, Monica can put it together. I think if you're on the FBC email list, you've seen this one. So uh, it's the fellowshipwv.org SS Sunday school. The, not, the SS Job sounds like a, a ship. I don't know if you ever want to name your ship the SS Job. That's probably not the best. Well, anyway, so there's a Sunday school. And on that site is the video for each of the Sunday school classes uh, that we have. So if you didn't catch something or if for some reason you want to watch it twice or three times, you're able to do that. There's also the PowerPoint slides that we're using every week. So by, whenever Monica gets that on, it's going to be available. But if you just go to that website, you'll be able to see it when it's updated, as well as uh, a question or message box. So there's a, if you go to the site, you, you, do, you can't be, anonymous. well, I guess you can't be anonymous if you put like Bullwinkle Moose as your name or something. Uh, there, there's a, a, a reference out of the past. So you, can, so you put your name and your email, and then there's like, it's not like a gigantic box size, it's like a small box to ask a question or things that you would like to see covered in the Sunday school class. If you ask a question like, why do bad things happen to good people? Probably not going to get a good email response from that one, a little lengthier than we were looking at. But if there was something that needed to be clarified or a comment you wanted to make, or again, some question that you think would be good to, to address in class, then this would be, that would be the place to do it. So, uh, and, and I have no idea who else is going to be watching these Sunday school classes. So it could be people that aren't even attending FBC would be going to that site and asking questions. And some of them may have some interesting things to say or to, or to address. So anyway, there's the, the class website the regular fellowshipwv.org website with the, the SS Job after it. So this is our second week, so it's probably a good idea to review what we had, just a little bit of a review and what we had in week one. Uh, and we'll see what you remember, see what comes up, see what you've reflected on in the last week. So first, easy review question, what does the Bible say about Job's character? What kind of a person are we dealing with? What's your, what's your answer to that? What was that? He was righteous. He was righteous. What else? Blameless. Yeah, no, no one could. Yeah, that's probably the better, the better word would be blameless, isn't it? Blameless and upright, or he does the right things. So no one could lay a charge against him. What else do we know about his character? The what? Chose evil. Yeah, not only, did he just, not only did he do the right thing, but he stayed away from doing the wrong thing. So he stayed away from that. Uh-huh. Person of integrity, later on when we read in the book of Job, people in the, in the city gates, the, the, the village elders, the city elders and those that are important that make decisions relied on him for judgment and for opinions uh, and, and his integrity stood out. One more thing, you can say a lot more things about Job, but just one more thing about his character. How did he, how did he? That, that's, kind of, that's kind of getting later on, yeah. So he, so he had a, a close relationship with God, right? So he, uh, we, can, we can say that. So really, when we're looking at the 
typical good person, Job is the typical good person. If he was attending FBC, think we'd be happy to have him on the elder board? Yeah, you know. So he's the kind of person you want to have around you. He's the kind of person you want coming to your, your church. He's the kind of person that, that you want as your neighbor. So he's really one of those guys that, you know, we call them the quote unquote good guys, right? So then we know the, the trials that come upon him. And in the first two chapters, he endures two very difficult trials, or we should even call them tests. What was the first in the first test, what was Satan's claim against Job or against humans in general? What is Satan's claim against, against who we are? Why do, You're bribing them to, uh, by giving them blessing and good life to kind of follow Jesus. Yeah, who, and who was he talking to? Who, who was that bribe? Who was he charging with bribery? God. Yeah, so he's saying God, God gets people to worship him because he bribes them. Give them goodies, they're going to worship you. Take away their goodies, they're going to curse you. So that was his claim. What was it so, and what was the test that happened to Job? What happened, what did he, what got taken away? Family, wealth, you know, all of his moorings were taken away. And what was his response? Did he curse God? What did he say? I came into the world with nothing. I'm leaving with nothing. So instead of cursing God, he blessed the name of the Lord. Second test, what was Satan's claim? What is his charge against humanity? What is his charge against humanity? Skin for skin. Meaning what? Uh, you take away his health and yep. you know, touch his body and he's history. Yep, so we're willing to trade anything as long as we keep our health. Once you start affecting our health, then we curse God. And we, we know what happened as, uh, as a result of Job. Uh, and again, who's he charging to that? Who's he making that charge against? Mankind. Against God. He's making a charge against mankind. He's, also, uh, he's making the charge or the claim against mankind. And it was a pastor I knew a long time ago said, we're, we're all made of the same cookie dough. So it doesn't matter whether we're, whether we're living in 2021 or in Job's time, we're all made of the same cookie dough. And we all have those same kind of responses. And we were saying last week, Satan's claims have, you know, there, there's an element of truth to them as we look at some people around us and how they react. So he's not saying anything way out of the ordinary. We all know people that curse God once they lose their, what, what their security is in and their wealth or, or family. We know that people who walk away from God when, they're, when their health fails them. So his claims are not without foundation. And Job's response then is what? After he's afflicted with this horrible disease, what's his response? He says, that's way, that's way down in chapter 13. So his response is, when, he, when that happens to him, I know you, you weren't ready for this quiz, that's okay. So should we receive good from the hand of God and not troubling and distressing things? So he still maintains his integrity doesn't curse God, even though his wife was inciting him to do the very same thing that Satan said he would do anyway. So there's our, uh-huh. Could you define cursing God? Because some, one of the translations said blaming God. What, help us make that conversion. A curse is to lay, is to lay, a, lay a charge against or to wish evil on or to bring up, bring up, a, dis, uh, bring up a disquieting or or a, a troubling thing about them. Basically, it means to, to just disregard them and to lay some blame against them, right? So blessing is reward and extolling their virtues, things like that. Curse is to, is to lay the, the charge of doing wrong things against them and to bring a, you know, to, to, to have hurtful or harmful feelings or, or intention towards somebody, as if a man is going to harm God. You know, what, what, what are we going to do to curse God? But we can still lay blame against him. We can still lay claim against him and, and that he's doing evil, right? So really, in the first couple chapters, who really is on trial in the book of Job? What was that? You said, so someone said Job is on trial, but really, really, who is on trial? What, so what do you mean by God is on trial? Well, um, Satan was trying to get... Job to move away from God. So test him and see if God, how he feels about God. Yeah, so it's really, 
okay, God, you're the creator of the universe. You have all these people that quote unquote worship you. Why do they worship you? Who are you that people actually want to, to be in a relationship with you? So God is the one on trial. I know it seems a little bit unfair when we look, see, well, it seems unfair when we look at all the difficulties Job goes through and everything to say, oh, well, God's the one that's on trial. Isn't he big enough to take care of himself and his own reputation? But really, the book of Job is a thought-provoking book that says, what really is the reason that people worship God? And what will it take to break your relationship with God? Satan's been doing that from the beginning. You look at all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. I can't remember if we, did this, if we said this last week or not. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, what was it that he wanted Eve and, and Adam to do? Separate from God. God's holding out on you. He knows you, know, you can eat any tree. The reason he doesn't want you to eat this tree is because if you do that, then you're going to be just like God yourself. He's holding out on you. You're missing something. So the intention is there's a, to try and drive that wedge in between because people don't worship God just for who he is. That is going to be a, 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 an integral and important question by the time we're, we're finished with this book. Not just why do people in general worship God. Why do we, why does Tom worship God? What makes me stay with God in difficult times? What might drive me away from God in difficult times? So that's the reflective part as we look at a book, of jo a, a book like Job, one of these wisdom books of the Old Testament. So as we continue on into the, the next section, we're going to spend the next two weeks on discussions uh, with Job, discussions of his, his friends or counselors, um, and, and even God himself. And as we look in the next two weeks on these discussions, there's a lot of words, a lot of verbiage, a lot of verses in these, in these chapters. We're obviously not going to go verse by verse, but we can take some section by section. Today, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get some foundations for looking at these discussions uh, some, and, and kind of get some helps on how to read and what to look for as we're going through these chapters. So this week and next week, we're going to be looking uh, at chapters uh, 3 through, through 41. Before we get to chapter 3, we have the little bit of ending of chapter 2 where we have some new characters coming into the story. So we so enter into the story Job's famous friends. So turn to the, turn to the uh, book of Job chapter 2. And if somebody could read for us verses 11 through 13, that would be really great. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Beldad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Okay, so we call them their friends, and, and at, least for, at least in the first few verses, they act as friends a little bit. We'll see if you would still call them friends by, by the end of the book. Uh, and also, the, his, if, here's one of those little Bible joke things. With short, you know who the shortest person in the Bible was? Bildad the Shuhite. So there. So if you get nothing else, you'll remember that horrible, horrible little Bible joke. Yeah, you're already shaking your head. I know. There's more of those to come. Anyway. Oh, there we go. So it says where the people came from. The location isn't completely certain. The, you know, where... Uh, where Eliphaz is from, Timon is probably just outside of where, of where Job lives. So we don't know the locations for certain, but they were some distance away. We'll just leave it at that one. And we really have no clear idea how much time has passed, not only from chapter 1 to the end of chapter 2, but even from the time that Job has been dealing with his, his, his illness, his, his sickness. But if you think about it, they had to make some kind of a group arrangement to get together they, it calls it an appointment or an arrangement, some kind of group arrangement to get together and meet at the same time to be with their friend Job, who's going through all these difficulties. 
And you know, I think we understand that in, in, in that time, they didn't have Facebook, so Job wasn't posting, pray for me, I'm going through so many difficulties and all that other stuff. You know, and then posting pictures of his cat or something else that maybe survived it. <laughs> there was also no like Job's friends WhatsApp group, so they couldn't just say, hey, let's all meet together at, at Job's house on this day and whatever. So they had to have a lot of conversations back and forth amongst the three of them, maybe the four, depending on where Elihu was living uh, at the end. So there was probably some weeks, if not longer, have been passing that Job has been scraping his scabby, pussy skin and going through all of his, uh, going through all of his problems. So when we read this, verse, what was their intent? What was the reason they went there for? So verse 11, what's the two, uh, what's the two, what's the two things it says they came to, to do for him? Sympathy. Give sympathy and comfort. Uh, that sounds really... It sounds nice, doesn't it? So we'll see. But their idea of sympathizing and their perspective on what brings comfort, that's where we run into a little bit of a problem. So for right now, their intentions are good. They, they heard what their friend was going through. They want to be with their friend, commiserate with him, and you know, bring some kind of, of what, what, what they would consider comfort into the situation. But when they get there, they couldn't even recognize what Job looked like. And whatever this disease was, it was disfiguring. It was, we said last week, it was probably something that was repulsive. It, 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 was, it made people revile him when they looked. So I didn't, I didn't copy any Google pictures. And you know, I don't think we need to, to do that up here. But just if you're interested, and no one really knows what the disease is that Job had, but you figure if Satan is allowed to give whatever disease he wants, he's going to go way over the top, even up to the point of death. So if you have some, some free time and, bef and before or after you eat lunch, I don't know when you want to do it, Google, do, do image.google.com, look for smallpox, or syphilis, or scabies, or even elephantiasis, or a combination of all of them, and then maybe add a little bit more. And there's some, I mean, there's some pretty grotesque pictures on there to where if you look at the person, you'd say, I don't want to be in the same room with them if they're looking like this, adding all of his other maladies. So as they're coming on, they don't even recognize their friend. And maybe he does have distorted face from elephantiasis. He's covered with pustules and, and things. So they're, I mean, it, it, they're, uh, they're, they're aghast when they come in here. They don't even recognize this person who they thought they know. So when they get there, no one says anything. They just sit there for a week. Why, why are they waiting so long to say anything? I mean, why just sit there? They made all this effort to come there for this particular day. Why are they sitting there? Why are they even waiting? Why are they, why are they doing nothing? Apparently nothing. Hmm? Yeah, so, so what are they waiting for? Hoping he gets better or what? Yeah, for Job to start. Yeah, how, how's he going to start with this one? So they're just commiserating it to us in our, in our kind of Western American way. Seems like a waste of time, doesn't it? Just sitting with somebody, not really doing, apparently not doing anything. But when, you know, living in, in Nigeria the way we do, we see that when, when there's a death in the family or something, people will come, they won't sit for seven days necessarily, but people will just come and they'll just sit outside the house just so that the, the larger family unit or whatever is left of Job's family in this case knows that there's somebody out there with you. So people will just come sit, say nothing for a long time, and maybe before they go, they pray. So we see a little bit of this, not to the seven-day level, but we see a little bit of this even where we are. So then they wait, and they see, uh, uh, they wait till Job is actually the first one to speak. So Job does speak. He starts first in chapter 3. So chapter 3 is the beginning of Job's, uh, what we would call a lament. Lament isn't a word that we use a whole lot in English, but it's a, a word that shows up a lot in Old Testament studies because of the Psalms and ways that people pray. So I think it's helpful to consider what is a lament. By the way, has anyone ever used this word in regular English in the last, I don't know, six months? Anyone? No? Oh, you have. Okay, well done. Okay. <laughs> not today, though, right? Not, not counting today. Okay. Oh, very good. So we have at least one. So it is something that some people use. But in the, in the, in the, in the scriptures, when we look at a lament, and this is kind of a, it's a specialized word for, for a particular type of prayer or song or psalm. 
A lament is a prayer of contradiction. It doesn't mean a prayer is contradictory. It, a prayer of contradiction is, this is what I believe, but this is what I see. Or this is what I know to be true. This is what I'm experiencing. So it's a puzzle. It's a paradox of life. And it's, an ex it's just a way of saying, something's not the way I think it should be. Or another way of looking at it is a, a cry to a silent or seemingly silent or absent God. Not that God is absent. And then we'll, I'll give an example in a little bit where that comes out really, really clearly. So when God doesn't seem to be there, you cry out to the one that you think is not there for you. Or it's an effort to make sense of a world where all the structures, all of our moorings, everything that we have been trusting on or believed about, they seem to have failed. Whether it's society structures or religious structures, church structures, people that have moral fail, you know, uh, Christian leaders of moral failing. Uh, so those are the, the uh, uh, sense of where structures seem to not be in place anymore. A moaning of being alienated or a moaning of despair. Not just, and not just saying, you know, I'm feeling pretty low today. But it's that groaning, that just, just th that expression of inner grief and despair. Yet, with all of this complaining and wonderment and all these, there is one key to a biblical lament that is different than just normal, everyday, non-spiritually minded people complaining. And what do, you, what do you think is the key, the key to a biblical lament versus just worldwide groaning and complaining? Any ideas? Uh-huh. Oh, there you go. A spoken from a place of hope. Every lament, whether it's by whether it's in the Psalms or whether even what we see in the book of Job, every lament, every one of these, these places where people feel like they're at sea and they don't even know what's maybe they don't even know what's true anymore. Maybe they're even they're even hesitant to say I believe because they don't know what they believe anymore because their belief system has been upended in some cases. There's still a place of hope. There's still an idea that God and, and that then that mostly that place of hope is that God is a faithful God. And even though I don't understand what's going on, and even though it, it, it grieves me and dredges up these emotions from me, at the end of the day, I know that there's something that's going to help me get through this, which is different from the rest of the world without God, apart from Christ, who lose their social moorings, who lose their 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 entire sense of purpose in life and have no hope. So lament is a, let's call it a legitimate or an authorized way of crying out to God the things that we see that just don't seem right. And as we look at, when we get into chapter three in, in a little bit, we're gonna see how Job expresses his lament. Chapter three and the rest of the book. It seems like every time Job talks in the book, there's gonna be some form of lament in that. So two quick examples in scripture. Um, I'm not gonna, because of the timing, I, I, I wanna try and get us out earlier than we did last week so you can at least get a cup of coffee or visit other rooms or visit with people. Uh, so two quick examples in scripture, I think you'll understand where these are. First, can anyone think of a Bible book that really, really emphasizes the idea of a lament? Yes, I, I knew the Bible teacher, the book of Lamentations, why do you think the book of Lamentations is called Lamentations? It's a lament. Uh, it's a, and, it, and it's lamenting or it's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. So that's what the lamentation is, the funeral song about the destruction of Jerusalem. And yet, even in this book, which is several chapters of, of things that are just, uh, it's, it's dredging up all these emotions, some of the most famous words that we have in our hymnology comes from that book. This I recall, therefore I have hope. It's because of the Lord's mercies were not consumed. And have you ever sung a hymn called Great is Thy Faithfulness? Ever hear that hymn? Where do you think those words come from? Yeah, from Lamentations. So even in a book that's a funeral song, we get that idea of hope. Another quick example is Jesus and quoting Psalm 22 from the cross. So maybe you don't know that psalm, but I know you'll know these words. As soon as I begin this phrase, you'll know what he's saying. My God, my God, why, what? Have you forsaken me? From Psalm 22. And a lot of times in, in the, it, it, when, when biblical writers or biblical speakers are quoting 
psalms or chapters or something, it takes the entire, uh, if, even if they're only quoting the beginning portions of the verse, they're considering the entire chapter. And in chapter 22, Psalm 22, when Jesus is quoting that psalm, it's the whole psalm that he has in mind, which means not only do I feel forsaken, but at the end of the day, God is going to show himself strong and restore these things. So even, even in the, the, the Old Testament book of Lamentations, the New Testament example of Jesus and his lament on the cross, there is that idea of hope. So when we go through this book, we're going to see a lot of, of, uh, of complaining on Job's part, a lot, of, a lot of lamentation on Job's part. But look where there is some hope. So uh, we're running out of time. There's a, I was going to show a short video on honest prayer versus grumbling. I'm not going to show this one because of time. But if you ever see Fiddler on the Roof, there's a, yeah. you, know, you, you already know what I'm, you're all laughing. You want to see it? It's like a minute long. You want to see it? Yes. Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> but how do I play it from here? All right, we'll just play a couple minutes. We'll just play a minute or two of this. Whoops. So the re I know, wait, wait, wait. The reason I'm playing that is sometimes when we pray, we think, okay, we're going to sit down in our prayer closet. We're going to fold our hands and get all quiet and say, oh, dear Lord, thou most high and holy creator of all the universe. And we use like prayer language. But prayer is, if we're doing continual prayer, it's like conversing with God. And even though this is this movie, Fiddler on the Roof, it's, and the person that's in this movie is a, is a Jewish guy, not particularly close to God, but at least somewhat religious. It's not a, it's not a, a, theo, uh, it's not a, a, a theological study on, on how to pray, but it shows how someone who at least has a passing knowledge of God continue, uh, considers that conversation with God and expressing how he's feeling, right? So there's the, there's a reason for it. Okay, so let me try this again. So anyway, and it goes on a little bit longer. And then he complains about his about being poor, and, which leads into a song. Would it hurt you if you were to make me a little bit rich? And then you, if you're familiar with this, uh, yeah, there you go. If I were a rich man, comes next. So, but the, the point of all that isn't to, to extol one person's uh, problems with God, but it's to say that some that maybe our prayer life might be helped by having honest conversation like this. So we're, maybe we're afraid to say to God how we really feel as if he doesn't know what we really feel anyway. So when a character in a, in a, in a musical says, you know, what do you have against me? You know, maybe they're being a little more honest than what we are in our prayer saying, well, I know all things work together for good. We say that with our mouth. And yet in our, in our heart of hearts, we're saying, God, what do, you, what do you have against me? So Job's lament is an honest prayer. The difference between an honest prayer and grumbling is what we accuse God of afterwards, right? So anyway, we'll continue on and we'll see how that, how that separates it out. So we look at Job chapter 3, and here's another one of those little, those little biblical jokes. Who was the most foul-mouthed character in the Bible? It was Job. He was cursing from the day of his birth, or cursing the day of his birth. So we look at chapter 3, starting from verse 1. After this, after seven days of sitting there with his with his friends, no one's saying anything. He's still scraping himself with his broken pieces of pottery. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth and said, let the day perish on which I was born. The night that said a man is conceived, let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it nor light shine upon it. And then he goes on and says some similar things to that all the way down to verse 10. So he curses his birthday. And since, he, and since his, his birth did happen, then he wishes something else. 
from verse 11. Well, since, my, since I was born, why didn't I die at birth? Come out of the womb and expire. Why did the knees receive me or the breasts that I should nurse? So since he, since he obviously was born, his next problem is, well, why, didn't I, why wasn't I stillborn? He even says that. Why, why couldn't I have been blessed like some of these stillborn children? Wow, he's just getting some real, some real heartfelt attitudes here. So I want to read two verses, verse 13 and verse 17. Let me read these verses, and, and let's just say what Job really wants. So look at verse, look at verse 13. He says, why, why, wasn't I, why didn't I die when I was born? For then I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest. Verse seventeen, or verse sixteen and seventeen. Why was I not as a hidden? Not, why was I not as a hidden, stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there are the weary are at rest. What is it that Job wants at this point? Yeah. Rest. So he's been suffering so much. All he wants is for his his difficulties to be over. That's all he wants. Has any have, have any of us ever been to that point? where it seems like trouble after trouble after trouble, difficulty after difficulty, responsibility after responsibility, and all we say is, I just want to rest from this. So we, we've been there. In Job's case, it's so bad, he says, I wish I was stillborn. I wish that when I came out, they couldn't even resuscitate me, and I was just dead. He said, it would have been better for me to have never lived than to go through what I'm doing right now. He said, death, how sweet is death. In death, there's rest. In death, those that trouble me are no longer there. In death, ah, there's, there's no difficulties. How different is that from, you, from someone like Paul in the book of Philippians who says, you know, if I die, I get to glorify Christ. If I live, I get to glorify Christ. Whether I live or die, this is great. But the troubles that Job is in says, oh, forget life. Why, did, why was I even conceived if I'm going to go through all of this? Wow, what a, what a difference. And then we continue reading on, and um, he's still asking how great it would be to, to be dead. Verse 25 and 26, For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I'm not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. Wow, what, whatever we would call a lament, this is a lament. Verse 25, for the thing that I fear comes upon me. What, what is it that he fears? So was Satan right then? Is it, is it ill health? And it's, it, it, note that it's, all, it's present tense, not the thing that I feared, but what I fear, the ongoing situation that he has. So is it just the ill health? It might be a might be another another answer to this one or an additional answer. Suffering, suffering in general, but suffering for what reason? Well, not in the ill health. We have a lot of other losses too. So he lost, and he's losing everything, even as he's sitting there. So, so his fear is his is is his loss. Is that what he is that what he's really fearing? What will come next? That what? What will come next? Okay, so yeah, if, this, if it's gotten this bad, what's what's left? But did I serve God for nothing? Oh, maybe there. Oh, now I think we're probably getting a little bit closer. He maybe at the end of the day, Job was Job had in his mind that if I do the right things, God is going to keep blessing me. So why am I serving God? Maybe there are some questions here. Maybe the thing that he feared is that. I would sin unknowingly and have these things happen. He was, a, the word is scrupulous. He paid attention to details, not only for himself, but, on, but for his children. Careful to sacrifice for them in case they would have done something in one of their, their birthday parties. What kind of wild birthday parties were those kids having? He was so concerned about the presence of sin that maybe he says, did I do something wrong? Did I miss something? So it doesn't say what his fear, what he really, really fears. But I think as we read through the rest of the book, as, as you read through the rest of the book, because we're not going to have time to do it verse by verse, as you read through the rest of the book, look for what might this be that was really in his soul. And having said that, I know we've said from the beginning, Job was a, uh, an upright person. He was blameless. 
The things that happened to him weren't because he, he committed any sin. But where does Job need to grow? And maybe verse 25 is the beginnings of something that says, you know, this guy may have needed something by the end of this book. And all that's happening to him may not have been terrible things that happened to a basically decent guy. But what would have made Job even better? What would have made Job more complete? And if he's fearing something, maybe these fears that he had, and we can articulate them better uh, as the book goes along, maybe these fears are the things that God would be driving away from him at the end. Like I said, there's a lot of questions in the book of Job, a lot of reflection, not necessarily answers to everything. So he views everyday life, he's not at ease, he's not quiet, he has no rest, but now he says, every day I have nothing good happening, uh, nothing pleasant happening to me, only trouble. As someone had said, I don't know if it was Sylvia, whoever it was that said, or Joe Allen, what's going to come next when you've encountered so much of this, right? What's the straw that breaks the camel's back? All right, now here's a question. Think about this for a moment. Chapter two, even chapter one and chapter two, Job is like, oh, you know, I didn't bring anything into the world. I'm not leaving with anything. Blessed be the name of God. And, you know, God gives good and God gives distressing things. Hey, that's who God is. Now he's like, I just want to die. Oh, I'm getting his trouble. Ah, oh. what? So I'm asking, what happened between chapter two where Job is like this guy that maybe the, the more the way we normally think of Job, that patient sufferer who maintains a pretty rosy attitude, even in spite of losing everything he has, including his health. And chapter three, and he's not even done talking to God yet. You wait, wait till we get to later on in the book. What what, do you, what happened? I'm asking you this question. What's the difference? What, what happened to him in the space of here? It's chapters, but it could be weeks. Say that, say that more loud. So, so your comments can be on record, on video, so everybody can hear them. Say that more loudly. I think perhaps he took his eyes off of God for So he may have taken his eyes off of God and put it on his trouble. Okay, there, there's, that's a possibility, right? Because maybe he's looking. But he's, even if he took his eyes off of God, he still does a lot of talking to God later on. In fact, chapter, chapter 7, he, he has a, some pretty some pretty raw things to say about God. So, right. any other? Oh, so he's compare, comparing himself. So, so as he's looking at them, they're, you know, they're all seeming to be okay. So he's comparing his friends like, hey, look at them. They seem to be doing okay. And I've lived my life this way. Uh-huh. Uh, the length of time with no relief. Mm. So it's okay for a little bit, it's okay if it happens for a day, a week, but now it's like one on top of another, and doesn't that wear on you? Even a, even a small pain, you get a small pain for a while, and it starts to wear on you. You get chronic pain, people can get grumpy and cranky. You get this for a long time with no, and he says, no let up, no ease, nothing's, nothing's relenting. I'm not getting any better, the trajectory is going this way. Wow, it just it wears on you. So he's he's very human in that, isn't he? Anybody else? What what uh, what happened? Uh huh. Well, I have, as any of us in the healthcare profession, we know how people's perspectives really change with with illness. You mentioned that, but I think the issue is hope because you know people can endure a lot if they have hope in a treatment, hope in alleviation or maybe a good day to but once it's just mm -hmm. ongoing nothing good no relief it's what we do yeah can bear hardly bear it mm -hmm. but even in all this what is he held on to or what i should say what is he not jettisoned or what is he not thrown away at least yet Yeah, the, the, the God, God is still in the picture somewhere. He may, understand, he may not understand exactly where, but he understands God is in the picture somewhere. He can't see it. It's, it's clouded. 
our spirit gets burdened and weighed down. And this lament is just an honest way of saying, God, I just want to die. You know, the, the best thing for me would be if I just pass on. I and mean, I, I don't know if you've ever been to that point. And I don't know if, if you've known people like that, but they just, they despair of life. And that's where, that's where our main character is right now, is he's despairing of life. So there's the, the first words that are said after seven days with his friends, at least the, the friends that are spoken here. There could be other people around there too. We don't know how many people were actually in there. So the first words spoken are, ah, oh, I, I just want to die. It'd be better, not just want to die. How sweet would death be at this point? And then comes the speech cycles in the book of Job. So now his friends get a chance to respond to the suffering and Job's comments. So the reason they say cycles is because they repeat. So there's three, three cycles of dialogue or discussion, and they follow kind of the same pattern. The, one of the friends speaks, Job responds, another one speaks. So the first, the, the first cycle, chapters 4 through 14, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar with Job inter, uh, interjecting that. So they say something, Job responds, sometimes to them, sometimes to God, sometimes to people in general. Then the second cycle, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar speaks again. And by the, after the first, if you've read through these, these uh, chapters, the first, the first cycle is like, okay, hey, here, here's, here's what's wrong, Job. Here's, here's how we can fix this. Second chapter, they're starting to get a little more irritated because Job isn't doing what they said needs to be done. By the time we get to the third cycle, they're, just, they're all irritated. You know, they're irritated because Job's not repenting. Job's irritated because they're horrible counselors, all that other stuff. So they're, so they're just, everyone's like having a really, really difficult time so relating to one another. It's just a guy fest. Guy fest, isn't it? well, yeah. Let me tell you how to fix this. Yeah. Well, well in all fairness, right. But in all fairness, his wife had a fix too. Curse yeah. God and die. So, you know, yeah. at least she was, at least she, she was, she got to the point. She was brief. Exactly. And guys are usually wants to get to the point. So, what? So anyway, and then um, on that third cycle, the reason I put Zophar in red with a question mark is there's this little bit of a section where is Job really talking or somebody else in there? But basically, in these chapters, you have three cycles of discussion. It gets more more irritating as you read through, right? So we're not going to, be able, we're looking at the, today, at least whatever time we have left, we're going to look at just the first part of the first cycle of, of his talk with his friends, just to get an idea of how things are going. So this is what I would call the Ebzi School of Biblical Counseling. Ebzi being the Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu School of Biblical Counseling. <laughs> So if you were to go to their school of biblical, biblical counseling to see how to help or comfort somebody, here's, here's their, their intention. First, they, have, they did mean well. They did mean well. But they actually ended up making matters worse at the end of the day. Remember, their intention was to sympathize and to comfort from, from chapter 2, verse 11. But at the end, instead of making things better, they, they made things worse. They had one logical explanation for troubles with some slight variations as we go through. As you read, they're going to sound, I mean, it does sound a little bit redundant at times, too. Let's just be honest about that when you're reading through the book of Job. It's like, don't these guys have a, aren't they learning anything? Aren't, can't they, like, change, change a different track or something? You know, they have basically one way of thinking about troubles and how, and, and how to deal with them. First, all suffering is a result of sin. Job is suffering. Therefore, what? Therefore, Job has sinned. That makes it really nice and clean cut and easy, right? Mm -hmm. When we have an easy, clean cut theology like that, sometimes things really shake that up. When we look back at what Job feared most, maybe what he feared is his theology was conflicting with reality. And we're seeing an easy theology, a quick theology of these friends that's going to lead them down a wrong path in trying to comfort Job. So from their point of view, if you were them, I should say, if you were them, or from their point of view, how can they help Job? What does he need? He needs to figure out how he sinned and repent. 
There's it. Figure out how you sin. And even if you can't figure out how you sin, because you, you still need to repent. Right. So their main goal to comfort Job, but what is their main goal then, James? Get him to repent. Get him to repent. I mean, it's kind of like what Job is doing with his children earlier on, right? He's like, just in case you've sinned, I'm yeah. going to do a sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, it's not the same, but I'm just right. saying that. That I if you don't know what's going on, just do this anyway. Which again goes back to maybe the thing that he feared is there's some kind of hidden sin. There's something that he didn't, there's something he didn't quite do right. So maybe as we're talking about how Job was maintaining his integrity and the Ebsey School of Biblical Counseling says everything, result, everything uh, wrong in life is a result of not doing everything you should do. Maybe Job has a little more of that than we're, than we're thinking which puts the whole book of Job into a different perspective on what it means to serve God and what he's expecting. Well, I do think this highlights um, the problem of very simplistic um, answers because who of us have not doled out some of the same Oh, we're, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Form, but it's simplistic. It's a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. Oh, we're gonna, we'll get into that. But hey, if, but if it's a really good Band-Aid... I, if, if, if it's a really good band-aid, that, that could help. So he needs, so the way they help Job, recognize, recognize you sinned, what you need, you need repentance. All right, so then as we look at where, where does this idea come from? Is this like something new? Is this something that they just invented on their own as they were, as they were on their, their WhatsApp group getting ready? Hey, what are we going to say when we go, when we go to, to Job? So where does this idea come from? There's a, a uh, phrase called uh, retribution theology, which means that God, it's an assumption that God bless, God's blessings are based on how good a person is and his cursing or his, the difficulties he brings on people is based on how bad a person is or acts. Is that, that just seems to be something that we have as a deep-seated conviction, no matter who we are or where we come from, right? This is nothing, this is nothing new. In fact, there are two, uh, two examples I'll give. This is a concept that we can't easily abandon or jettison from our lives. So we're looking at, as we said in the book of Job, some people that lived during the time of the patriarchs, you know, certainly um, if, if it's an older, old book, long before the days of, of Moses. So we're looking at a, uh, at a book that happened a long time ago from people that didn't have the complete record of Scripture. But even when people do have a, a larger collection of Scripture and God's revelation to draw from, draw from, it still isn't an idea that we get rid of quickly. For instance, in John chapter 9, so let's turn there really quickly. We'll do these really quickly. In John chapter 9, someone read for us John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Now, this is days of Jesus, New Testament times, possibly as much as, you know, two, you know 1,800, 2,000 years before Jesus. So we're, we're talking a long time before Jesus. Plus now we have all the other scriptures, people going to synagogue, learning what the Old Testament says, Torah, teachers. So, so John chapter 9, someone read verses 1 through 3. So even after all of this teaching, all of this time, knowing the book of Job, these are Jesus' disciples. They've been reading the book of Job for I don't know how long. They know the story. They know how it turns out and what, the, and what retribution theology is and is not. Even after all that, they look at a blind man and say, not why is he blind, not what caused this. What is their first words? What is their first question? Who sinned? Because something horrible like this must have been the result of Sin, either this person sinning before he was even born or, his, or what he would do later on or his parents, sin that caused this. We, we can't get rid of this thinking in our minds. Why, why is it that this sticks with us so much? Uh-huh. You know, I, I don't know. Everybody here doesn't know my husband, but he's suffering a lot. And he won't be because he's very sick and dying. And he suffered a lot. And people ask me, well, did he do something? I said, no. Yeah. He told God when he got saved and he was in seminary, he said, I want to be able to suffer for you. Mm-hmm. And he said that when he died, he wanted to suffer. And I go, well, I didn't consult me first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. he, never, he never got bitter 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but again, the people's first the first question is, what'd you do wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking a lot of that reap what you sow. I mean, that's in the Bible a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. Do this, this is going to happen, or do this, this might happen, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then it just to me it ties back to humans thinking they can earn their salvation. Yep. So if I do all these things, then I will be guaranteed this life or this internal life. So it's just that base, basic human need to control our destiny, I guess. No, no, and that, so there's part of that. So if we do enough good stuff, then we earn what we have. Right. And there's also the negative part of that is there is one thing that humans do understand from the very beginning, and that is guilt. Guilt simplifies everything, doesn't it? So because these three friends can't really grasp what's going on in this life, what's, what's happening with Job, they may not understand everything God is doing, but they understand guilt. You do something wrong, you get punished for it. We've been, humans have been dealing with guilt ever since we, ever since Adam and Eve ate the fruit, saw they were naked, covered themselves and hid from God. And we've been dealing with guilt ever since. They may not understand the ways of God, but we understand guilt. And you get what you deserve. And you get punished for what you've done wrong. And we reel that into and bring that into our easy theology of here's the way the world works. You do good stuff, you get blessed. You do bad stuff, you get punished. We do it with our kids all the time. <laughs> Don't we? Be good or you won't get ice cream, have computer time, do whatever like that. We do it. You, you, if you're really good, you get extra. If you're really bad, you get a time out. Or in another day, you got other punishments that, that happen to you. So we do it all the time. We grow up with that way. It's a way of correction and discipline. And we apply that to every area of our life so quickly. So the, this deep-seated conviction of, re, of retribution theology may come from our those those first stirrings that we had in our cookie dough of disobeying God and feeling that guilt from the beginning because it does answer it answers a lot of questions it may not answer the questions correctly it mixes up truth and logic so consider this and I think you had already mentioned this too about reaping what you sow if you sin you will suffer is that true yes because the wages of sin is death, wages of sin is death. immediately Ah, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's that different that thing of time. But basically, if you sin, you will suffer. What is true about that statement? Well, it's biblically true. Well, you're going to suffer regardless. I mean, you're already a sinner. So yeah. You will suffer. It doesn't. Well, it might be after death. Yeah. So, th right. so there's your time. So what we're missing is the 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 idea of time. When does the suffering takes place? Right. And it negates or or it misses the idea of God's grace and long suffering and patience. Yeah. Would you say that, you know, you hear a lot of people, why, why do bad things happen to good people? Does that, would you think that that concept of when we say that, that kind of has a root somewhere deep in here? Exactly. Because if you're good, think good things should happen to you. Really, who's good? We mentioned that in, about the book of Job anyway, right. right? So yeah, and because if I do the right things, I should get something. Again, it's, uh, it's, it's like, it's the way we train animals. Mm -hmm. Here's a little treat. Here, shake my, shake, 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 oh, good doggy. Here's a treat. Shake, shake, good doggy. Here's a treat. So then the dog will come over to you later and say, without even asking, because it wants a treat. We do it. Our animals do it. We do it. We're no different than our little puppy who wants that. Yeah. The question was asked twice, why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah. And I heard it, that only happened once. Well, yes. Yeah. And, and the answer is, when did that happen? Yeah, with, with Jesus. Right. Yeah, so really, who's really good? And we mentioned that. We say Job didn't deserve this. Well, really, what, what do we deserve? That was a question asked last week. What really did Job deserve? Just like all of us deserve, death. Really, and it's a, it's a harsh thing to say. But the only reason we receive anything good is because of God's graciousness and long-suffering. And you're right, the only, the only person who was truly good that a bad thing happened to was Jesus. So, that, so again, we have to throw out uh, this whole idea of retribution. Uh, let me, I need to move on quickly. So, does this follow? 
So if you, if you sin, you will suffer. So does this follow? If you suffer, you have sinned. Does that make sense then? No, but that's the false logic that the friends are using. And if you, if you take any kind of logic classes or whatever, you'll see how just not, not just in, in biblical thinking, but in, what was that? Yeah, the, the, that's, well, that, that may not be circular, but there's, it's, a, it's, a false, it's a false conclusion on that one. Syllogism. Yeah, false syllogism. Mm -hmm. So as we look at the dialogues that happen in the book of Job, it's a lesson for us to avoid judging without having all the facts. By not having the whole, the whole picture, we can really make some mistakes. And what we see in the next several cycles of speeches in the book of Job are people that don't have the whole picture and yet make these assumptions about what has happened or what's needed to happen. So the first cycle, the intention was, like, we're not going to, anyway, we'll see, maybe we have a couple minutes to do this, at least a start. No, anyway. <laughs> I, I'm going to start with, I'll start with one, with some of this, and we'll, we'll finish it next week. In the first cycle, we're just looking at the first interaction between the first friend, Eliphaz, and Job. So chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7. And we're just going to look at different parts of this. So we'll call this Eliphaz 1. Here's a question before we even look at what he says. Have you ever been hurt by an attempt, by somebody's attempt to help you? And I don't mean like someone's trying to help you move your furniture. They, they accidentally dropped a piano on your foot or something like that. I like someone who, in the, in the context of Job, someone who's trying to say words that, that are helping you and it ends up actually hurting, right? Yeah, that's, that's happened to a lot of us. There was a, a person that um, I knew, not even from this state. I'm, I'm even gonna tell you, I won't tell you, okay, his last name is Smith. That should limit it down. Right? But I won't tell you anything else about him, not even from the state of West Virginia. So... The, the guy was he, was, he was a minister. He was actually really, really well read. He was a, a pretty decent theologian. His library was like exceeded my own at, at some point. And so one day at church, he, so he's married, he had a small child, he had, he had a son. So one day his son was, went to church um, to kind of hang out there while he was doing his work. And his son was climbing up on a bookshelf, on one of the church bookshelves. The bookshelf fell over and crushed his son. And so here's a guy, I mean, the irony of that a guy who's a, a well-read theologian whose son died at church from books. So, so during the funeral, one of the people that tried to be helpful to him said, well, God must have really wanted your son to be with him, to take him with him right now. And, and, you know, so they were trying to be helpful. So his response was, what, God doesn't have enough already? And then it went down to where he was no longer in ministry I actually got a couple of deals from the books he was selling uh, as a result of that. But, he, but he, uh, he was really, really left because of not just his hurt with God, but the way just other people weren't able to bring some kind of help to that situation. So there's an example of saying something like, oh, God must have really wanted your son to be with him. That's not what he needed to hear at that time. Nor, you know, anyway, there's a whole lot of other things wrong with that kind of a statement. They tried to help they ended up bringing more hurt. And that's what we see in someone like Eliphaz. So look at his introduction. Chapter four, verses one through eight. I'm gonna, I'm just a couple more minutes and then we'll, I'm gonna give you a, um, maybe something we can look for for next week. Eliphaz, the Temanite answered and said, if one ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? <laughs> Yet who can keep from speaking? Behold, you've instructed many and you've strengthened the weak hands. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling and you've made firm the feeble knees. That sounds pretty good so far. He's like really saying good things about Job. But, there's the word but. But now it's come to you and you're impatient. It touches you and you're dismayed. Is not your fear of God, your confidence and the integrity of your ways, your hope? Remember, who that was innocent ever perished? Actually, I can think of Several. But anyway, we're, this is what his, his conversation is. Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. You even said, you just said the same thing. Eliphaz is agreeing with you, or you're agreeing with Eliphaz. You sow trouble, you reap the same. By the breath of God, they perish. By the blast of his anger, they're consumed. 
So there's his opening, those are some of his opening remarks. What and what he says, just quickly, what does he say that's helpful? One or two things that's helpful. Anything? Well, that he has, that he has helped people in the past. Yeah. He's done, done good things. Yeah, you know, hey, you, you, you've spoken some real truth in the, in the past. You've, you've helped a lot of people. Even though that he turns and says, ha, but now you're not practicing what you preach. So what does he say that's hurtful? What's one or two things he says that are hurtful in this situation? Like who was ever innocent that ever perished? You know what I mean? And what's the implication? Uh, obviously you've done something wrong. Yeah, you've done something wrong. So, I mean, to, to put the most positive possible spin on this, and he is the first one to speak, and Job hasn't responded yet, the most, the most positive possible spin I, might be, you know, Job, this could still turn around yet. You know, if you're truly innocent, this isn't going to end in, in, in trouble for you. That's, and that's trying really to stretch something to make a, you know, uh, a, a silk purse out of the sow's ear of some of his, some of his, his conversations. There's some phrases that, phrases that are foundational in Eliphaz's thinking, uh, like, was, like was just read in verse 7. Remember, who that was innocent ever perished? Skip down to verse 17. Can a mortal man be right before God? Can a man be more pure, more pure than his maker? In other words, what are we going to say to God that's going to justify ourselves? And then even moving on into chapter 5, 6, and 7. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground, but man is born to trouble as sparks fly upward. In brief, what he's saying is, Job, we're with you, man. We're with you, bro. We've all sinned. Man's born to trouble like sparks fly upward. Don't, don't feel embarrassed because you've done something that's causing all this to you, Job. I know you've done something horrible. We all have. That's part of their sympathy. Bro, just, you know, just, just admit it. Deal with it. We've all been there, right? No need to feel embarrassed. No need to feel frustrated. God will, make, God will get this right with you. That's, that's his attempt at comfort. We're all sinners. Just admit what you've done, and you're in good company. Well, there are some examples of. Uh, we already did that one. So there are some examples, not only in this in this conversation, but in the rest of what we're going to go through of BCP, which is short shorthand for either bad counseling practices or bad comfort practices. <laughs> and actually, I've only I listed two. I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In two chapters, I counted eight bad counseling practices just from Eliphaz's first discussion with Job, things that you should really, really avoid if you're trying to comfort, let alone counsel people. So here's, a first bad, here's a, an example of a bad counseling practice. So chapter 5, verse 8. As for me, I would seek God, and to God I would commit my cause. Move over to verse 17. Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. And verse 27 at the very end, behold, this we have searched out. It's true here, and know it's for your good. First example of bad counseling practices is to assume that you know what the problem is before you even talk to the person. So you've already made those, he's already made those assumptions. He's already said, here's what you need. I know this. This is, he, he sounds so authoritative. Actually, he sounds arrogant. <laughs> Look at verse 27 again. This we've searched out. It's true here, and know it for your good. How arrogant. Going to, you know, look, we're all, we're all made of the same cookie dough. Job, we all do this. We all sin. We know this. You know this. What we're saying is true. Hear us. Listen to it. Do what we say, and you'll be fine. That's his, that's, that's a bad counseling practice, isn't it? It's a bad comforting practice, too. To assume you know what's going on there. So then another example, uh, I, I'm, we're not going to go through all of them. Chapter 4, verse 8. Chapter 4, verse 12. Chapter 4, verse 16. Chapter 5, verse 3. Chapter 5, verse 3, 8, and 27. I, 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 me, 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 we, we, I, I, I. It's all about him. Job is the one that's suffering, and look at how many times, just in a couple chapters, Eliphaz talks about me, I. I've seen this. I know this. I've observed this. I say this. It's, it's, it's self-indulgent. He thinks a lot of himself. 
In fact, as you go through Eliphaz, I think, he li I think Eliphaz likes to hear himself talk. And sometimes he's even talking, one of the bad counseling practices is he gets on tangential verbiage. He just starts talking, sure he's talking about God, but here's Job suffering and, and, and he's going on this long descriptive phrase about the glory of God, which is true, God is glorious, isn't he? But it's like, you know, are you, are, are you in the moment here? Are you really tracking with what's happening? So all this to say, as Eliphaz talks and says these hurtful things to Job from, the, from, a, from a, a, a basic thinking that is flawed, it goes downhill from there. And then after that, starting next week, we'll look at Job 1. Now, just as we end, I, uh, you were handed out a paper that might help as you're reading through this to put some perspective. I don't think I have, where's my copy? Anyway, can I borrow, uh, let me borrow that one. <laughs> so as you're reading through these chapters, and this is the pattern we're going to follow for, the, for, for next week as we go through Job's response to Eliphaz, as well as the other friends and, and Elihu next week. As you're looking through, as you're reading, there's REF is for the Bible reference. What are some of the positive actions, attitudes, or statements that the characters make? And then what are some of the negative actions, attitudes, or statements that the characters make? So someone like, someone like Eliphaz saying, I know this is true. Listen to us, and you're going to be okay. Now, I don't know, maybe you would call that a positive statement. Me, I would think that's kind of negative in Job's, in Job's circumstance. So you'd put the reference and what the thing is to, to avoid, right? Things you, want to, things you want to avoid doing. Now, on, granted, on a, on a chart like this, the positive statements made by Job's friends, that one's going to be kind of you know, exemplary things, things that, we're, things that we would want to emulate or, or copy. That might be a bit blank over here, realizing that one. But there might be some nuggets that we would be able to get in there. But this helps to frame the kind of things that people are saying, and especially, especially where Job is coming from. Because Job is on a journey in this book. And we're all, we're all on a journey, right? Job is on a journey. And we have the, the privilege of seeing how he deals with these things as he goes through them how he reflects on it, how he responds to what the people are saying. And in a, in a twist, uh, a little bit of a twisty kind of way, the bad counsel the friends give actually helps to sharpen Job's view of who God is and what he needs. So even at the end of the day, all the reprehensible things that the friends say about him, even to pointing out specific sins that Job did, and they have no idea whether that's, that's true or not, it's going to help Job in the long run. Right? So before, as you're, as you're going through before next week, if you go through some of this, uh, and I guess if you want to even a shortcut from what's on, this, um, uh, what's on this page, if you're reading through, and I would really encourage you again to read through those chapters, what are some things that stick out that, that you would say, wow, I should never, ever say this kind of a thing to someone that I'm trying to comfort or counsel or sympathize with? Or to put it in a, in a more practical way, God, keep my mouth from saying these things in the presence of people that are suffering. So as we read through, that's kind of a, a way of, it's a negative way, but it's also a, something to help to, to personalize scripture. All right, so, let's, uh, so starting next week, we're going to look at Job's response and then just kind of just shoot through the various chapters and see how the friends are responding, what Job says back again, and where Job's perspective comes from. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you again for the scriptures that we can read in our language, for the way that it expresses the, the reality of life in, 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 in its raw form and to show us the, the inner workings of how you're, um, how you're ruling your universe and your creation. Uh, we, we echo the, the prayer of the disciples. We believe, help us in our unbelief even as there are things that we just can't comprehend or, or put in, in our easy theological boxes and things that challenge our, our thinking. Help us to not lose, uh, help us to not lose our, our way in those challenges, but to let us be strengthened as a result of them and to come out refined as a result of wrestling with these issues. Lord, we thank you again for the, the way that you've given us a possibility to meet like this. And we look to you even as, as those um, uh, around us are suffering 
uh, financially, they're suffering uh, with their health, they're suffering in so many ways right now. Uh, we, we ask that you would bring a, a way of drawing thoughts and hearts toward you, even in this situation. So we pray for all of these things to be accomplished for Jesus' sake and for his glorification. Amen.